uh, afternoon and evening, everyone, and welcome to the Global Immuno Talk. And it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Uli von Andrian uh, as today's Global Immuno Speaker. Uh, Uli was born and raised in Munich, Germany, where he obtained his medical doctor degree and began training as a neurosurgeon, in fact. Uh, he then realized early on that research was more interesting to him than clinical work, so he underwent uh, postdoctoral training at the La Jolla Institute for Experimental Medicine, as well as at Stanford. Uh, he was then recruited to Harvard Medical School, where he quickly rose through the ranks, uh, and he is now the Edward Malincroft Jr. Professor of Immunopathology, and he is also a program leader and member of the steering committee at the Reagan Institute at MGH, MIT, and Harvard. So uh, as biased as a former trainee can be, uh, I believe that Uli's contribution to immunology has been tremendous. Uh, he is a very creative scientist who is not afraid to venture in the most disparate topics. And I'm just going to focus on a few of his uh, contributions. Um, one of his major focus um, uh, has been the molecular mechanism of immune cell migration and homing in lymphoid and non-lymphoid tissues pioneering and uh, implementing um, a number of intravital imaging strategies. And his, his work uh, really laid the foundation for the, the multi-step adhesion cascade that regulates leukocyte trafficking and has become a textbook uh, immunology. Uli's group uh, was among the first to characterize the dynamics of T-cell interactions with antigen-presenting cells in living animals. He described three sequential phases whereby this process occurs, uh, dissected the rules uh, that govern the transition from uh, one phase to the next, and assess the impact of each phase on uh, T-cell function and differentiation. Uh, further, in a series of studies that I had the privilege to contribute uh, to as a trainee in his lab, uh, his group characterized the innate and adaptive immune responses to lymphoid pathogens, describing a critical role for lymph nodes at capsule sinus macrophages in viral antigen presentation, and as gatekeepers that prevent uh, neurotropic viruses from invading uh, peripheral nerves. And finally, he made the uh, surprising observation that uh, uh, natural killer cells can develop antigen-specific immunological memory to haptens and to uh, viruses, and the molecular and cellular underpinnings of this phenomenon are still uh, under investigation in his lab. Uh, for his work, Uli has received uh, a number of awards, including the uh, BD Biosciences Award from AAI, and served as an editorial board member uh, of the most important scientific journals, such as uh, Cell, uh, Science, and Immunity. He has mentored uh, 30 graduate students and over 50 postdoctoral fellows, most of whom have gone on to uh, successful careers in academia or industry. So thanks so much, Uli, for having accepted our invitation, and I very much look forward to your talk uh, entitled Immune Surveillance by Antiviral T-Cells. But before I hand the, the floor over to you, it is a tradition of, uh, of the Global Immuno Talk to ask speakers um, a personal question uh, to get to know them a little bit better. So the question we um, chose for you is, um, as an immigrant yourself, uh, what advice would you give to a, a young scientist who is training abroad? Well, thank you, Matteo, for introducing me. It's great to see you. Um, I also, thank you to your co-organizers uh, for inviting me to speak here. It's it's really an honor. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, when when we leave our home countries, when we leave the place where you know people think, eat, speak like us, to go some other place um, to to make a career, um, we often have many preconceived notions about how things should be, what values are the right values. But if you come to an international research lab where, you know, many people are from different parts of the world, all asking the same scientific questions, um, communication sometimes can be, uh, um, um, you know, challenging in that, you know, everyone wants to say the same thing, but depending on where they're coming from, they will say it in very different ways. So it's very important to keep an open mind. Um, when you come to an environment where not everyone is necessarily accustomed to think like you do. And this goes actually even further because when I left Germany, I was determined to become a practicing clinician who might be doing a bit of research on the side. After I returned to Germany, that was some 33 years ago or so. Um, uh, but, you know, opportunities present themselves. 
and here too, I think it's very important to keep an open mind and ask yourself, are the preconceived plans, your vision of where you want to be uh, when you grow old, um, necessarily where life uh, might direct you? And so I think flexibility at that level too um, is very important um, to end up in the place that um, ultimately might create the largest success and the greatest degree of happiness. Of course, it's never a controlled experiment, right? We can only make one choice and then we have to live with it. All right. So with that said, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. And uh, <clears throat> the topic I have uh, chosen for today's talk is immune surveillance by uh, antiviral uh, T cells and um, particular CD8 T cells. Um, so uh, it, my laboratory has studied for a long time the, the question of what actually happens when uh, T cells um, encounter a viral antigen, particularly in the context of the sentinel organs, the peripheral lymph nodes, right, which drain interstitial fluid from peripheral tissues that allows information in form of either soluble molecules or cells to access these collecting stations, the lymph nodes, where naive T cells are constantly accessing these organs to look for a cognate antigen uh, uh, through high endothelial venules. Now, if there's a viral infection in the periphery and we have now an inflammatory innate response here, uh, dendritic cells pick up viral antigen they become uh, mature due to, to the encounter of, of uh, 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 maturation signals like toll-like receptor ligands. And so now they migrate in large numbers after upregulating co-stimulatory molecules and making cytokines to talk to T cells that come in from the blood. And these T cells, when they become activated, undergo a process of clonal proliferation. Uh, and then ultimately after a, a week or so acquire, uh, or maybe four or five days, acquire effector function. So these cells now can make inflammatory cytokines, they become cytotoxic, and importantly, they change the way they traffic in that when they leave the lymph node through the efferent lymph vessel to return through the thoracic duct back into the circulation, they now um, look for inflammation. And they do this by expressing on their surface uh, adhesion molecules and chemokine receptors or chemoattractant receptors that recognize inflamed endothelial cells in venules and peripheral tissues. And that's these adhesion molecules are not found on naive T cells. So naive T cells would pass through these vessels and basically ignore them. But once they have undergone this education process in the lymph node, as they return to the circulation, they can now find inflamed tissues, basically where the viral antigen came from, where the virus is located. And they can then eliminate um, this viral infection at its source. And so um, if you have all seen um, probably figures such as this that are looking at the uh, dynamics of an antiviral T cell population in the course of a viral infection, right? So the virus come in, it uh, proliferates uh, exponentially uh, and uh, with some few days delay, uh, T cells uh, in lymph nodes become activated, they start dividing, and as T cell numbers increase, they can now control the viral infection, the virus, viral load drops, and basically it becomes eliminated. The T cells peak with some delay, now there's no more antigen for them, so they start um, contracting uh, over a period of a few weeks. Uh, but ultimately, what remains is a population of memory cells that is larger in number than what we have in the naive state. Now, um, um, what are these memory cells? It turns out that they are um, obviously a critical component of what we try to achieve when we vaccinate someone. They are what prevents, uh, of course, in addition to antibodies, but what prevents uh, reinfection by an offending pathogen. And they do so by surveying our body in a very strategic fashion. And there's a division of labor in the surveillance. And this is really the topic of my talk today. So we have known from classic work back in, in, in the late 1990s from Federica Salusto, Antonio Lanzavecchia, that there are two populations of um, memory cells that are distinguished by their expression of traffic molecules that allow them to interact with high endothelial venules. 
uh, in lymph nodes, right? So um, cells that express such traffic molecules um, were proposed to be called central memory cells. And these cells are, you can find in the bloodstream. They uh, uh, adhere in high endothelial venules. They can access the lymph node like the EFT T cells too, and basically undergo this, go this reactivation process here as, uh, um, again. Whereas there's another population of cells that's often, at least in the early memory phase, the to dominant population, which no longer can home to lymph nodes because they have less lost these homing receptors to interact with high endothelial venules. And these are called effector memory cells. So initially in, in, in a classic study in 1999, it was proposed that these effector memory cells may be the ones that actually survey peripheral tissues. And in fact, if you look in peripheral tissues, you will find a lot of memory cells, but subsequent work has shown that many of these memory cells actually do not arise from these effector memory population, but rather in the early uh, uh, um, uh, effector response here, there's a wave of cells that leaves lymph nodes that access peripheral tissues, even when they're not inflamed, and under the presence of, of local signals become tissue resident and then um, take up residency there and they might migrate locally, but they don't leave that tissue for long periods of time. So these are sort of the classic three populations of memory cells that uh, the textbooks have been uh, looking at until about five years ago. And so now there's a lot of things that we actually don't really yet understand. For instance, uh, we know that these effector populations here are not some sort of monolithic one population, but they're actually phenotypically and functionally quite heterogeneous. So what is their actual relationship to memory populations? This is actually rather unclear. Also, um, although we have good understandings of uh, uh, regular uh, um, um, resident memory cells because of markers that are sort of diagnostic for them, particularly CD69, and in a subset also CD103, as well as for central memory cells, which as I mentioned, express CCR7 and L selectin or CD62L, the two critical homing receptors that allow these cells to home to lymph nodes. This large population of so far called effector memory cells that are negative for these traffic molecules had been really understudied in large part because they were basically defined just by the absence of markers. And so uh, work in my lab from now is already six years ago indicates that there's actually a positive marker to identify these cells. And this is a chemokine receptor called CX3CR1. Now, CX3CR1 had been studied for a long time and much of the literature actually looks um, at this receptor as being diagnostic for monocytes. And this is based on work from Stefan Jung who made a CX3CR1 GFP knock-in mouse. And if you look at an uninfected, naive mouse straight out of a pathogen-free animal facility, you can see that all the monocytes express GFP, so they're CX3CR1 positive. Then there are a few NK cells, but T cells are really by and large negative. However, um, actually um, this is uh, a kind of misleading because this is only seen in the naive state where these T cells have never been stimulated by anything. So Ashley Mosman, who was a graduate student in my lab years ago, infected mice with LCMV. And these were the CX3CR1 GFP reporter mice. And when he looked in the draining lymph node of these mice, he found that indeed in a naive mouse, there are basically no GFP positive CD8 T cells. On day eight, at the peak of the effector response to this LCMV infection, over 80% of CD8 T cells were CX3CR1 positive cells. And we didn't see this only with uh, um, uh, um, uh, LCMV specific cells. In fact, it doesn't matter what kind of T cells you find. And it also doesn't matter what kind of stimulus you use. This is a very robust phenomenon that where, where these uh, cells become basically um, very um, um, intensely CX3CR1 positive. So um, basically what, what we found is that this marker um, comes up fairly late in the T cell response. So if you have a naive T cell, that it becomes initially activated, it starts proliferating. It takes until about day six before you see actually CX3CO1 expression coming on. But a day later, and then uh, um, in, uh, as we go to the peak of the effector response by day 10, CX3CO1 bright cells really dominate the picture. However, they are always 
a population of intermediate cells as well as CX3C01 negative cells. And uh, this uh, phenotype of CX3C01 correlates with other markers that are typically uh, correlated with the degree of effector differentiation. Basically, the more CX3C01, the further these cells become uh, go to a terminal effector phenotype, where they make different cytokines, become very cytotoxic, whereas the relative small population of CX3C01 negative cells basically has this least differentiated phenotype and the intermediates are moderately differentiated. Now, um, looking at um, effector cell populations in this way, then we ask, well, um, how um, are these cells related to what happens in the memory state? So we take uh, uh, mice in which we adoptively transfer congenic OT1 cells. So these cells recognize through their TCR a peptide from ovalbumin, and they are CX3CR1 reporter cells. Right? And then we infect this mice with LCMV that expresses ovalbumin, so these OT1 cells become activated. And by day seven, when we have all three populations now in the spleen and peripheral blood, we sort out each subset and we give an equal number to infection matched uh, uh, congenic recipients. And then we ask uh, six weeks later, what memory do we get out of the bright, the intermediate and the negative cells? And so what we see is that the CX3C01 intermediate cells have on a per cell basis, the highest degree of potential for giving rise to memory cells and the intermediates are intermediates and the bright ones are uh, at the lowest. However, keep in mind that 80 plus percent of all effector cells in this initial donor animal actually the CX3C01 bright cells. So even though on a per cell basis, these bright cells give rise to less memory cells, if you look at the population at large, memory cells uh, um, from all three populations basically contribute rather in uh, equal numbers to the overall memory population seen. Now, what is important though, is that the phenotype of memory cells coming from each of these subsets is quite different. In that um, recipients of CX3C01 intermediate effector cells had memory cells that were sort of equally divided in CX3C01 negative, intermediate or bright cells, Whereas the CX3C01 bright effector cells only gave rise to memory cells that were also CX3C01 bright. And the intermediate cells made memory cells that were either CX3C01 intermediate or CX3C01 bright. And so maybe CX3C01 tells us something more than just, well, these cells have been activated and are differentiated. And that's why I'm getting to next. But so what if you now follow these cells for longer periods of time? And so um, Carmen Gerlach, um, who was then in the lab, infected mice with um, um, LCMV over and, and basically didn't sort them out by day seven, but just let them go for an entire year and asked, what is the phenotype of these three populations? And you can see here that CX3C01 bright cells don't just differ from these other populations by their CX3C01 expression, but so they are, remain continuously CD27 negative, they're also CXC03 negative. And so if you gate on this population and then CX3C01 positive, but uh, CD27 um, and double positive cells as intermediates and those negative cells over time, you can see that uh, uh, the dynamics in which these populations are represented in the total memory pool change over time. And the best way to look for that is uh, uh, in here, where we basically look at the frequency of each memory subset in the total memory pool. And so you can see um, early on, CX3C01 bright memory cells predominate, but after about six to eight months, these cells have contracted in number, become much fewer, and the CX3C01 negative memory cells take over, whereas the intermediate population always re remains at about 10 to 15% um, at the end of the uh, uh, contraction phase. And that's not only true in mice, we also see memory CX3C01 positive memory cells, i.e. CD45RO positive cells in humans, and this is gated on CDA T cells. You can see two different donors, and we find in each case uh, some um, CX3C01 bright, intermediate, and negative memory subsets. Okay, <clears throat> so um, what does it mean that there are these dynamic changes in the memory cell compo composition, composition over time? One possibility is that these 
bright cells ultimately turn off the CX3CR1 locus and then join this negative population. Um, another is that um, the self-renewal population of these different uh, memory populations uh, might be different. So to distinguish between these uh, two possibilities, we again did, again did adoptive transfer, but this time we, we basically let these cells go until the memory state and then sorted them out. Again, gave an um, equal number of a highly sorted population to naive recipients. And when we adoptively transfer these CX3CR1 negative or high cells, we see that basically over a, a um, 10 week period, they remain stably uh, in the phenotype that we originally transferred them in. However, if you transfer CX3CR1 intermediate cells, we were in for a surprise in that it turns out these cells uh, uh, decline in frequency, at least in their CX3CR1 intermediate phenotype, and we see an increasing number of CX3CR1 negative cells in recipients of, these, um, of this subset. So how can we explain this? Well, if you look uh, at, at the steady state in endogenous population of memory cells, notice that these CX3CR1 intermediate cells are actually very stable in frequency relative to these other two subsets. So how come after adoptive transfer, if you find this uh, uh, loss of phenotype, apparent loss of phenotype and, and increase in CX3CR1 intermediate cells? Well, it turns out that if you look at um, uh, their proliferative state, uh, by uh, looking at KI67 um, in, 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 uh, uh, in the memory cells from these mice, the CX3C1 intermediate cells are proliferating at a much greater rate, about at twice the rate of the CX3C1 negative cells and more than 10 times the rate of these high cells. So what happens then is that CX3C1 intermediate cells constantly divide and they appear to do that asymmetrically. So they generate CX3CR1 negative cells, which then are added to this, th this pool and actually can fully explain why this population becomes dominant over time. And proliferation of this mem memory population is sufficient to basically maintain their number uh, constant. Now, um, what I haven't told you yet is what are these different cells? So it turns out that if you phenotype CX3CR1 negative cells, they basically all express lymph node homing receptors. So by that old definition, they basically send from memory cells or TCM. CX3CR1 bright cells are always negative for 62L and for CCR7. So I think they are you know, classically what we would consider effector memory cells. This intermediate population that had not been really noticed previously is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, more ambiguous in that it can express 62L, but not all of them do. But most of these cells express CCR7 and that they, at least in the, by the fact that they migrate to chemokines that act through C CCR7. So, and, and these cells are found in lymph nodes and they also recirculate peripheral tissues. So we call these peripheral memory cells. And I'll share with you briefly how we came to that conclusion. But so this is basically what we know here. I've shown you this before, right? This is the effector sort of differentiation. And if you now keep going and follow these populations over time, the effector, uh, the, the CX3CR1 bright effector cells can give rise to effector memory cells and only effector memory cells. These cells poorly self-renew as shown by this sort of uh, skinny um, circular arrow here. Uh, and so over time, the cell be population becomes less and less prominent. CX3CR1 negative effector cells can directly give rise to central memory cells that express lymph node homing receptors. And this intermediate population here gives also rise to a memory population that remains intermediate, but uh, becomes uh, a, a very proliferative. And by proliferating more than any of the other subsets, they actually uh, feed the central memory population and basically add to its growth um, over extended periods of time. And just for completeness, I should mention re um, resident memory cells and peripheral tissues um, are CX3CR1 negative, and in fact come probably from CX3CR1 negative effector precursors. Okay, so what are the properties of these intermediate memory cells? Now, if you look uh, uh, in uh, uh, peripheral blood um, of mice or in peripheral tissues of mice, we find uh, memory cells in both compartments. How do you tell them apart? 
So an experiment you can do for that, you give OT1 cells to a mouse. Next day, you infect them with LCMV over. So now they proliferate. You wait until day 40 when there's memory. And now the trick is we give a small um, bolus of fluorescently labeled anti-CD8 alpha antibody. And after three minutes, we take out every organ that we are interested in, as well as the blood. So the antibody in this short period of time can label all the intravascular CD8 T cells, but it doesn't have time to diffuse out into peripheral tissues. So the T cells in the periphery will remain um, um, negative for this intravenously injected antibody, but you can now stain them with an antibody to a different epitope with a different color. And so if you do this with blood, you can see, of course, all CD8 T cells are stained by the intravascular antibody as well as by the secondary antibody. But if you look intra, in intraepithelial lymphocytes in the intestine, virtually all of them are, of course, extravascular, right? Okay, so you can do this now with many different tissues and then ask, what's the phenotype in terms of CX3CR1 expression? And so here we looked at a large number of different tissues, and this is work from Olga Barrero, a postdoc in my lab. And wherever, where always the red uh, part of the bar shows CX3CR1 negative central memory cells, um, and of course also tissue resident memory cells, at least in the extravascular compartment, right? Neither, neither of those express CX3CR1. Uh, and then we have intermediate cells. Um, uh, um, which which uh, uh, um, are abundant in peripheral tissues as well as in lymphoid tissues, but we also find them in the blood. In the blood, however, the dominant population are CX3CR1 bright effector memory cells, which are also intravascular in the liver and in the lungs and in the spleen. However, if you look at the CX3CR1 bright cells in the extravascular space, they're basically missing from most tissue except the spleen. So this is a rather complicated situation where these memory populations are inhomogeneously distributed. Um, so CX3CR1 negative central memory cells, of course, you find them in secondary lymphoid organs, as you do with these intermediate cells, but not these bright cells. However, the original idea of effector memory cells had been that they survey peripheral tissues, yet we don't find them in the extravascular space of peripheral tissues. Now, of course, the challenge here is that um, uh, we can't really be entirely sure about um, what these extravascular cells are. Are they actually migratory recirculating cells or are they also tissue resident cells? It's a mixture of the two. We know that the recirculating cells leave tissues, go into lymphatics, and so they return to the blood mainly through the thoracic duct. So that means if you want to know what is actually going through peripheral tissues, we can cannulate thoracic duct lymph and then look at memory populations in that compartment where cells basically return from peripheral tissues and from lymphoid tissues, of course, back into the bloodstream, right? So here we are looking at cannulated thoracic duct lymph from a mouse in which we have injected, uh, we have induced memory cells. And you can see in the blood of these mice, there's a dominant population of this effector memory population. But in thoracic duct lymph, that population is much, much less. And there's actually a, a, a much, much greater population now that is uh, CD62L positive. So this is obviously a lymph node homing receptors, which means these cells likely have home through high endothelial venules into lymph nodes. They spend some time in lymph nodes and now they are on their way back via the efferent lymph to return to the bloodstream. So normal recirculation. However, these populations of cells that are 62L negative are unlikely to have come through lymph nodes. Most of those probably entered peripheral tissues and then left those tissues to come to the thoracic duct. So if you look at the phenotype of those uh, uh, migratory cells, we find that they predominantly are actually these C3CO1 intermediate cells. So for that reason, we believe that uh, it's actually this population of CX3CR1 intermediate rapidly self-renewing cells that do the peripheral immune surveillance, not the CX3CR1 bright effector memory cells. So that raises, of course, the question in the, in the effector phase and in the early memory cells phase, most of our antigen experienced CDAT cells are CX3CR1 bright yet they don't access any of these peripheral tissues. So what do they actually do? 
And so uh, Scott Lauerheld in the lab did an, an telling experiment, and he did that in a mouse, in which he had given OT1 GFP cells that also express beta um, an RFP under the beta actin promoter. So all these T cells are um, red, and then he imaged uh, the microcirculation of the ear of this mouse through the intact epidermis. So there was no uh, surgical trauma, no inflammation, but this animal was sort of in the recovery phase after systemic viral infection. And so we are basically looking at a maximum intensity projection by two photon microscopy of the ear microcirculation. And so you see some, some structures here that are hair follicles, which are just autofluorescence. Uh, there's an arterial that basically feeds oxygenated blood from the head of the mouse, which would be at the bottom of the image, into this tissue. So there's this arterial here. There are capillaries where the asterisks are, and then there's a venule that basically drains uh, blood back to the to the mouse. Okay, so uh, looking at this now by as a time lapse video, you can see these uh, um, RFP positive CDA T cells migrating in the ear tissue of this mouse. And this is a time-lapse recording. So one second of the video equals four minutes of actual recording. And so you can see that there are extravascular cells, but there are also cells that are intravascular, particularly in this arterial here. And now if you look at the GFP expression as indicator of CX3CO1, you can see something that's quite fascinating. The extravascular cells, for the most part, are either CX3CO1 negative or intermediate, whereas these intravascular cells are all CX3CR1 bright. And so if you look at this in a different way, namely by tracking uh, these individual cells um, um, from a, a time zero over the next period of time, you can see these cells are preferentially actually um, patrolling through this branched arterial here. This is shown in a different way here where the surface area that is scanned by these arterial in the lumen, on the luminal side, is much greater in arterials than it is in venules, where these cells are migrating more rapidly than in the extravascular space. And moreover, if you actually track these individual cells and ask how do they migrate relative to the direction of flow, you can see that most of their trajectories are actually going upstream against the direction of flow, like salmon swimming up river. And there's various ways by which you can show this, like here's a rose plot, and this shows the so-called migration index. We can see most of these cells are strongly biased to go against the direction of flow. Now there's other cell populations that are known to um, the, um, uh, patrol in microvessels. This was particularly shown by Frederick Geisman in, uh, for monocytes, which also express CX3CR1. However, when we look at monocytes, they go the opposite direction. They preferentially go with the direction of flow. So this is something unique about these effector uh, memory T cells. Okay, so um, this raises the questions, why are these cells in arterials? This was actually a surprise to us because we know the microcirculation is segmentally uh, divided into arterials where you have uh, basically regulation of blood supply, capillaries where you have gas exchange, and endothelial cells in these upstream microvessels are basically like Teflon. They do not support multi-step adhesion cascades for free-flowing leukocytes, including T cells. Only venular endothelial cells display the selectins and other uh, um, traffic molecules needed for cells that are fast flowing to actually undergo an adhesive interaction and arrest on the endothelium. And one way to illustrate this is here. Which, so this is a recording of uh, from that was done by Ashley Moseman, uh, uh, who infected a mouse with Leglaria. Uh, and this mouse expresses GFP in, in myeloid leukocytes. And you can see that in the arterial and in the capillary, there's basically no inflammatory cells interacting with the endothelium. They're in the bloodstream, but they're moving so fast you can't see them. However, venular endothelial cells support rolling and, and arrest of these cells, and this is where cells emigrate. So presumably, our CX3CR1 bright cells first have to uh, pass through an arterial to reach a postcapillary venules, and venules can be identified here by this marker dark, as we have shown a few years ago. Uh, and it's really only the venular path where these cells can slow down, roll, and stick, and now they can be arrested in the endothelium. 
So in order for us to find them crawling in arterioles, they presumably have to migrate upstream backwards through the capillaries back to reach the arterial compartment. And in fact, Olga Barrero did an experiment in mice where she uh, looked at uh, uh, the microcirculation of the ear and she was able to catch here a cell that uh, uh, arrests and now it starts to migrate and she has to move the the preparation each time the cell moves out of the field of view. So this is a multitude of videos that are all spliced together. And you can see that over time, the cell just keeps on going, keeps on going um, until it is all the way down here, basically. So in this two hours uh, recording, the cell continuously migrates across the direction of flow, uh, basically from the venule where it initially got captured all the way toward the arterial. And it passes like a this significant distance over this period of time. And so once it's in the capillary and now enters an arterial, some, like this cell here, it first goes downstream. Now it senses the direction of flow, I guess, and it turns basically around and goes upstream to scan this arterial in the lumen. Uh, this is not true only in the effector phase, but also in the memory phase. You find much fewer cells, of course, but we do still find preferential uh, screening of arterials. Uh, again, many of these cells go against the direction of flow, although the fraction of cells going with the flow now seems to become a bit higher. Okay, so how can you study these cells? This is actually not trivial. Of course, you do, can do intravascular staining, but when you do intravascular staining, you actually get a mixture of cells because there are some cells that are crawling. That's what we are interested in. But then there's um, also uh, uh, cells that um, transiently interact with venules because they're, let's say, rolling on selectins, they're adherent, they're on their way, um, perhaps emigrating into the tissue. And then there are cells that are free in the bloodstream that just happen to be caught there when you take out the tissue. So um, how do we uh, know about uh, which are the actual crawling cells? Well, we can do this in the uh, Kde um, system. So these here we inject um, OT1 cells that express this Kde fluorescent protein, which in the uh, normal state is green fluorescent, but after you expose it to uh, violet light, um, then turns permanently red and changes its, uh, um, um, uh, um, its emission uh, frequency. So what we do here is we induce this effector memory population and then we illuminate the ear of a mouse with fluorescent with this uh, violet light and photoconvert basically all of the T cells in this tissue. And now the key is we wait usually for 15 minutes, which is enough for cells to emigrate if they want to emigrate. Cells that are transiently interacting will have left the microcirculation. They get replaced by other cells. However, those cells would not be photoconverted. And the ones that are left are these permanently crawling cells, right? And so now we can inject an intravascular antibody like before, which will, of course, label all of the intravascular cells. But now we can look for the double positive photoconverted intravascular cells to identify selectively crawling cells. And so if we do this um, in, here, looking at uh, a KD uh, fluorescence, um, um, if you look in a control ear, none of the cells are photoconverted, whether intra or extravascular. But uh, after photoconversion, you can see all the extravascular cells are photoconverted, and about 40% or so of the intravascular cells are. So these are the actual crawling cells, right? And so we now can look at these crawling cells and we can show that they are actually phenotypically slightly different from the transiently adherent cell and that they are enriched for CX3CR1 bright cells that are also expressing KLRG1, a terminal differentiation marker. And so now we can vary the duration here of photoconversion and ask what is the frequency of this intravascular crawling population over time, which tells us something about their dwell time or half-life. And what we can learn from this is that the, the uh, uh, um, half-life of crawling cells in this ear microcirculation is on the order of four hours. Uh, uh, and, and then also now we can, of course, treat with antibodies to ask what are the actual adhesive uh, requirements for these cells. And what we find is that um, this is strictly integrin dependent and strictly dependent on just one beta 2 integrin, namely LFA1. Now, LFA1 has two endothelial ligands, ICAM1 and ICAM2. Now, if you look in the literature, most of the 
papers are on ICAM-1, which is sort of uh, considered to be much more interesting because ICAM-2 in vitro is expressed on endothelial cells at low levels and it doesn't change much uh, um, during inflammatory processes. However, if you look in vivo, actually ICAM-2 is quite interesting because if you stain uh, a whole amount of skin microcirculation, as we've done here, for instance, for CD31, which identifies all endothelial cells, or ICAM-1, you can see ICAM-1 really identifies venules and the venular sites of capillaries, whereas ICAM-2 identifies preferentially um, um, arterioles and the arterial side of capillaries. So um, as cells come in uh, and, and roll and stick, they first use LFE1 to adhere to ICAM-1, but as they then migrate upstream toward the arteriole, they become dependent on ICAM-2. And indeed, when we block ICAM-2 uh, in, in our k demise, uh, we uh, find that there's a substantial re reduction in the number of crawling cells uh, in these animals. And we can also see this by two-photon microscopy. So this is, gives us an interesting handle now to study uh, uh, what's the role of crawling uh, in, this, in this population of cells because blocking ICAM2 does not interfere with the accumulation of uh, cells in the peripheral tissues because that's ICAM1 dependent uh, since that happens in venules. All right, so um, uh, if, if you now look at uh, the CX3CR1 bright cells in peripheral blood versus crawling cells and do a principal component analysis, you can see that these populations are really not clearly distinguished. However, there are a few genes that are differentially expressed in crawling cells, i.e. CX3CO1 bright cells, relative to cells that we get from peripheral blood. And among these differentially expressed genes uh, is one molecule called um, um, uh, 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 CRAF6. Now, TRAF6 is an interesting molecule. It is known to be an adapter protein that is involved in cytokine signaling. It's also an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And uh, uh, work by, by Erica Pierce's lab has shown that in TRAF6 knockout mice, CD8 T cells um, can uh, undergo an, a basically normal effector response, but they are severely compromised at giving rise to memory cells. So we began to wonder whether there could be a role for TRAF6 um, induction on crawling T cells and their memory fate. So Bolga Barrera did an experiment in which she looked in peripheral blood um, T cells for TRAF6 expression by intracellular staining. So if you just take out uh, peripheral blood cells where there are many cells crawling, you can see that um, basically all these cells are TRAF6 positive, but they express TRAF6 at a relatively low level. So now if she treated with anti-LFA1 to basically detach crawling cells and have them add to the pool of circulating memory cells, there was a significant increase in the number of uh, TRAF6 bright cells that basically uh, are uh, uh, derived from this now detached previously crawling cells. So does that mean that perhaps uh, there is a role for uh, um, crawling and, and by inducing TRAF6 expression in the generation of memory cells? So to do that, we looked at um, um, ICAM-1 in, in, in inhibition. So basically, we uh, 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 wait until there's a memory population that is crawling. And then by day seven, we start treating these mice with ICAM-2 to prevent crawling in arterioles. And then we follow these mice for basically four months. And what you can see is that uh, when we inhibit ICAM-2, the effect of memory population becomes less and the central memory and to some degree the peripheral memory cell population becomes more, suggesting there's a skewing in the memory cell composition when crawling and arterials is prevented in the early effector states by the CX3CO1 bright cells. And another way to show this is, uh, is here in ICAM2 knockout mice, uh, where we show that um, uh, it, you know, you have a normal, basically, population of TCM, TPM, and TEM uh, in the wild-type mouse, but a severely compromised uh, frequency of this uh, TEM population uh, in, in the knockout mice. And this is particularly the KLRG1 bright uh, T-cell subset that is lost here. 
which then results in an increase in uh, CD62L positive, i.e. central memories like cells, whereas the peripheral memory cell population remains similar. Now, why would cells actually crawl in arterioles in the first place? Well, we think this is actually a novel type of immune surveillance. If you think about it, the one population of cells you really don't want to have a replicating pathogen is probably your endothelial cells. Of course, there are other cells too, but endothelial cells making virus, that's bad news because as soon as the virus comes out, or bacteria for that matter, it's bloodborne and you get bacteremia or viremia. Now, to, um, if, you, if your endothelial cell is in a capillary or a venule where there's either no uh, smooth muscle cells or very loose smooth muscle cells like here in this venule, um, then T cells or other immune cells that are in the extravascular space should have access to these um, um, uh, endothelial cells from the outside but not so presumably in arterioles because arterioles have systolic you know, blood pressure in here. There's a huge transmural pressure gradient. So in order to prevent arterioles from just exploding because of that high blood pressure, they are surrounded and tightly wrapped by smooth muscle cells shown here in green. And these smooth muscle cells are under constant tone to regulate blood flow. So these are very stiff and probably a formidable physical barrier that will prevent extravascular cells from actually interacting with endothelial cells that are coating the lumen of this arterial. So the only way how you can actually do immune surveillance is arterials is from the inside. But since arterial and endothelial cells don't support adhesion, your T cells must interact with venules first and then go upstream through the capillaries that don't express dark, so you can't see them here until they get into the arterial and then they have to keep moving in order to scan these cells for, uh, 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 for replicating pathogens. So is that actually true? What happens if we now introduce an antigen on endothelial cells? So uh, what we've done here is to look at beta-2 microglobulin knockout mice, so no class 1 expression on endothelial cells. And if you adoptively transfer OT1 effector cells, they crawl, no crawl normally on these. So at least for the crawling itself, you don't need self-antigen presentation. However, what happens now if we let these OT1 cells crawl in an arterial, and here's an experiment where I've done that, and now we inject intravenously the synfecal peptide. So you will see that come in when, when it becomes bright here in the arterial. And you can see as soon as we do that, these crawling cells in the arterial all stop, and they round up, and they become basically permanently adherent, and that depends on the dose of the antigen. So what we think happens is that as the synfecal is in the circulation, it replaces endogenous peptides on MHC class 1 displayed on the luminal surface of endothelial cells. And so these, um, these crawling OT1 cells now see this class 1, and it provides a stop signal that basically um, allows them to arrest here. Now, interestingly, these OT1 cells are highly cytotoxic when we use them in vitro. However, we see no evidence here that these endothelial cells get killed. There is no uh, hemorrhage, there's no thrombosis formation, and we are currently investigating what are the actual signals that are perceived by endothelial cells uh, from these arrested T cells. We have done some RNA-seq experiments that are still a little bit too early to share, but it seems there's a very strong interferon response that is actually induced in the setting. And I'll show you this one more time. So this is the control period. Cells are crawling, surveying these arterial and endothelial cells don't see antigen. The moment they see the antigen, you can see how they stop and now starting to communicate with these endothelial cells here. So I th we think this is a very interesting and probably very important phenomenon because many important pathogens are known to infect endothelial cells, including SARS-CoV-2, but also, for instance, cytomegalovirus, as well as bacteria such as rickettsia, also certain types of chlamydia species, and, and many, many others such as hemorrhagic fever type uh, pathogens and so forth. Okay, so what I have shown you then is that um, uh, there is actually sort of a division of labor and immune surveillance. Naive T cells um, go from the blood and the spleen through high endothelial venules to lymph nodes, look for antigen, return via the thoracic duct to the blood, and so forth. Uh, central memory cells, which is CX3-CR1 intermediate, 
uh, basically do largely the same thing, although they can also to some degree go to peripheral tissues. But it's mostly these peripheral memory cells, CX3CO1 intermediate, that visit peripheral tissues transiently. They spend a day or a few days there, then they leave through the afferent, afferent, aff afferent lymph for the lymph node, afferent lymph for the peripheral tissue, to basically access lymph nodes from the back door, but they can also home directly to lymph nodes through high endothelial granules, depending on whether they express 62L or not. And then they recirculate just like naive T cells do. Now the CX3CR1 bright effector memory cells actually don't do that, but they um, remain largely in the bloodstream and they survey the intravascular compartment by patrolling in a preferentially um, downstream to upstream direction uh, in the microcirculation and are enriched in arterioles. Okay, so with that, I'm done. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab um, who have um, really done this work here, uh, particularly uh, uh, Scott Lowett, who made the original observation, Ashley Moseman, who initially discovered uh, CX3CR1 expression of CDA T cells, Carmen Gerlach, who's really figured out um, what that all means. And then uh, Olga Barrero, who's really worked on the intravascular patrolling uh, in collaboration with all these other folks here in my lab. I also like to acknowledge our collaborators here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thanks a lot, Uli, for a terrific talk and a great journey uh, on T-cell differentiation and uh, immune surveillance. Um, so uh, I would like to remind everyone that you can ask questions to uh, Uli via Twitter, as always. You can search for the account Global Immunotalks, find the tweet that says ask questions for uh, Dr. Uli von Andren here, and you can um, reply to that tweet with your question and mention the hashtag uh, Global Immuno. Um, also, I would like to remind you that next week, uh, Global Immuno speaker will be uh, Lucy uh, Walker. And thanks again, Uli, and thanks everyone for attending. Bye. Bye.